again here this Sunday. As Pastor Trent said, it's great to have our guests from Praise Bible Church here today, our sister church, and uh, great to be worshiping with you this morning, and then have some uh, some, some lunch after and some, some games too. So uh, if you have not greeted them yet, maybe after the service you can. Uh, they're great people. And yes, as Pastor Trent said, uh, this has been the year of new titles for me, I guess. First it was pastor, then Mr. Teacher, and now it's uncle. So uh, it's been, been the, the years of new new abbreviations, so it's been great. So in 2003, uh, back in 2003, the Cleveland Cavaliers had the first overall pick in, in the NBA draft, and it was no secret what they were going to do with that pick. They were going to pick high school, 18-year-old phenom, the whole hometown kid, LeBron James, the number one overall pick. And once they did that, the entire city of Cleveland changed economically. People were buying tickets to the games, people were buying jerseys, people were eating at restaurants before the games. LeBron James getting drafted to his hometown in Cleveland was, was the most incredible thing that could happen to that city. And, and the people were chanting his name uh, and buying his jersey, like I said, and, and everything basically worshiping him. They gave him the, the, the name, the, the king, the chosen one was his nickname as an 18 year old kid. <laughs> his rookie season. So you can imagine just the hype that went around this. Though. We've never really seen it in professional sports ever since what the city of Cleveland did to, the, to their homegrown kid, LeBron James, when they drafted him. And he played there for eight seasons until when he was 26 years old, uh, he left in 2010 to join the Miami Heat. And when he did that, the entire city of Cleveland changed again. They were therefore burning his jersey. <laughs> they were chanting booze, booze when he came back to Cleveland. Everything about their view of LeBron James from this hometown kid hero had then changed this villain. And, and, and that's really what they called him, was a villain now. He was not a hero, he was a villain. He was an enemy to the city of Cleveland. And even, um, I've never seen, I remember as a seventh grader watching that game, I remember staying up late as a 12-year-old kid watching his first return to Cleveland, Ohio. And I have never seen that in professional sports again. Every time he touched the ball, they booed. It was 26,000 fans screaming, booing their heads off uh, during the, the starting lineups and every time he touched the ball. And, and it was something that you'll never see before. So when the human heart wants something, you know, they wanted a championship, they wanted to win games, they'll do anything at all measures to, to cheer for him, to, to triumph, to, 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 to shout with victory what, what they think he's going to bring. And then when he doesn't deliver and he leaves for another team, instantly the hate, the vengeance uh, comes out to play. So when Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, we really didn't see any hostility. We didn't see any hatred from the crowd, but instead we saw praise. We saw honor and we saw an excitement from the crowd. But it wasn't until the betray betrayal of one of his disciples, we know Judas, and, and the crowd starting to chant, crucify him, crucify him, and eventually the death on the cross. It wasn't until those things happened when we see that, saw the hostility and the hatred on display for Jesus. If you can turn your Bibles right now to uh, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 today. That's going to be Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. It is written, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethlehem to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village and in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was, was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foil of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and colt and put them on their cloaks. And he sat up on them. Most of them, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, 
This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. What an exciting passage to read. Uh, the book of Matthew is often viewed as the one gospel that closely connects Jesus with the Jewish understanding of the Messiah from the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, many Jews throughout history have come to Christ by, by reading the book of Matthew because there's so many uh, things like this where, we, where the deity of Christ is on display. They call him Lord. And uh, this would be such an exciting time, I think, to, to be a part of the crowd and to, and to be chanting these words, Hosanna, Hosanna. And I think I just imagine being there, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords is, is in front of you, and, and you're there chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna. What an incredible thing to be looking face to face uh, face to face with your Messiah uh, uh, as one, and I think just if we can put ourselves in this in this in the scene this morning, I think everything else that we're going to talk about this morning will, will will make sense and will follow. So I just, I just after reading that first, I think it's important that we set the stage for ourselves to to know and, and to understand what it would have been like for the people there that that day. The verses that we just read in in, in Matthew twenty one are seen as the triumphal entry. As Jesus is acclaimed to be the Messiah, as he enters the, the, enters the capital of Israel, which is, which is Jerusalem, and he enters for the Passover festival, and he enters on a donkey to show humility on, on the highest level. So today we, we call it Palm Sunday, and I'm sure we've, you know, who have been around in the church for a while, we, we, we've come to church on Palm Sunday before, and I hope that it's not just a tradition, it's not just, oh, it's Palm Sunday, got to go to church today, but I hope we have a, a relationship and we know that Jesus truly is the Son of God and that He is God and that that's what brings us here th this morning. Because I don't think we can truly understand Palm Sunday unless we understand who Jesus is and His nature of being fully God and, and fully man in the flesh. And that's what He claimed to be. We're not just saying that, I'm not just saying this, this is what He claimed to be. I really want to look closely on, on verse 3 here, uh, what Jesus refers to himself as. He calls himself Lord, meaning that he, he views himself as equal to God the Father. Jesus is claiming to have more authority than any of the prophets of the past, as he truly is claiming to be God in, in a flesh, a human, human flesh. And we look at Jesus being a king, we have to remember that he was more than just a king. He was the king of all kings. And more than that, though, he, he was God. More than just a king, the king of kings, but more than that, too. He was God. Just, just imagine that. And God didn't want to ride into the festival on a, on a beautiful white stallion horse, but instead he wanted to ride humbly on a donkey. And I know Pastor Trent shared this passage last week uh, with his sermon, but I can't help to, to share this verse again found in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, Who though he was in the form of God, did not count himself equal, equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but empties himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to a point of death, even death on a cross. So we see this on display on full effect, that, that Jesus being God didn't count himself equal with God, but instead he, he emptied himself in his majesty and, and glory to become a humble servant. And I think earlier this week a friend asked me, uh, another believing friend, because he ran into the same question of, of what separates Christianity from other religions. And we even talked about this in Sunday school this morning. So many other religions say, what can I do to please God? What can I do to, to, to make myself earning and deserving of God's favor? But instead our faith says, look what God has already done for us. Look what I've done in the person of Jesus Christ to humbly come down to earth and, and to die a death for, for us and our sins. So it becomes personal. It, it's not just a story or a historical narrative or even a religion. This is personal. This affects us in, in, our, in our own hearts and our own humanity. And I've always said if I was stranded on an island and I could only have one verse for the rest of my life to look at, it would be 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, which reads, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
that we might become the righteousness of God. So we are not in any way righteous with God before Christ, but Christ reconciles us and brings us into a relationship with him and changes us that, that we might become the righteousness of God. So I think that's very important when, when looking at the, the triumphal entry, and, and I think we have to ask her of the question, what does this have to do with Palm Sunday? What does this reconciliation have to do with Jesus entering in on, on a donkey? And I would answer everything. Everything. The power in, in the Palm Sunday story resides in the triumphal entry because of what he came there to do. We have to answer, why did he come into Jerusalem? Why did he come even into the world? And, and sure we know that Jesus was a great moral teacher. He, he taught us everything that we need to know about God. And sure he was the only human to never commit a sin. And sure he, he led a tremendous two to three year ministry where people saw the righteousness of God. But his real purpose to come was to die. His triumphal entry into Jerusalem wasn't just to celebrate the Passover festival with his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, but instead his real purpose was becoming the, the, the atoning sacrifice for, for my sin and for yours. This story isn't just historical, but like I said, this is personal, so that we can relate to him in his humanity, but also we know that he was thinking about us in that triumph. He was thinking about why he came to Jerusalem, but also why he came into the, to the world. Let's draw back to this text here. Let's look at verse 5 for a second. Uh, it says, Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fall of a donkey. So Jesus' enter into Jerusalem on a donkey was actually a fulfillment of, of Zechariah 9.9. Uh, which actually reads those exact words. He's just quoting uh, Zechariah 9.9. And if we read those words in Zechariah, those words on their own, if, we're, if we have no context of this story, and we just open up Zechariah and we read those words, it doesn't really make sense, especially back then, who definitely did not know this context because it hadn't happened yet. It, it just doesn't really make sense beforehand to, to imagine the fulfillment of, of those words. But if we can connect the puzzle pieces from the Old Testament to the New Testament, if we can connect the dots and see that this passage in Zechariah is really telling us the story about Jesus coming in, this triumphal entry that we just read about it in Matthew 21, then that makes sense. Um, there's so much in the Old Testament besides the story that, that, that intertwine with the New Testament. And the more puzzle pieces we can connect, the better we can understand the scriptures and the better we can understand God. So it's important to look at, at these texts that Jesus quotes, this, this prophecy that, that, that is fulfilled in, in the Old Testament and, and relate it to the New, because so often the Apostle Paul and even, even John and, and of course Jesus, they quote the Old Testament often because so much of Jesus coming into the world was prophecy that has been fulfilled. A perfect example of, of what I'm talking about here is when Jesus stepped foot into the synagogue. And, and he reads uh, the, the Isaiah scroll. He reads Isaiah 61.1. And what Isaiah 61.1 reads, uh, he, Jesus reads these verses himself very loud and clear, just, about, just like what I'm going to do right now. He says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of of the prison to those who are bound. And I think Pastor Trent and I could probably do a whole sermon on, on just those words. But the point remains, after reading that verse, he said, today this prophecy is fulfilled. So he had come to do all those things, to bind up the brokenhearted, to bring good news uh, to the poor. He, he had come to Jerusalem, he had come into the world to do all those things. But in order to do all those things, he had to die on our behalf, just like I mentioned earlier. All of these things leads us to a knowledge that Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem was a clear look for all to see that he was the righteous Messiah. And it's really interesting if we go down the verses from 6, 7, and 8 of this passage, and it tells us that, that both the disciples and the people in the crowd 
were, were going out of their way to give Jesus praise and, and worship, just like how I opened this message with, with the, the Cleveland fans. They were going out of their way to, to, to give praise, to, 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 to try to cheer for a winning championship team, just as the, the Jewish people were going out of their way to give praise to Jesus who was coming in, but they had a motive behind it. They, they wanted Jesus to rescue them from, from Rome, the, the Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman people, and just as, like I said, the Cleveland fans had their own agenda of why they were giving him praise and, and glory, because they wanted to win, to win games. And we could even go down that route with, with politicians, right? We, we, if we like what a politician says, we can, we can, you know, cheer for them, but at the, back end, uh, at the end of the day, we have an agenda in our mind of what we, what we want out of that. And another important uh, key passage, I think, in this in this uh, chapter here in Matthew 21 is when, he, when it says your king is coming to you and even all the way back in Genesis uh, Jacob prophesies about a king a, a descendant of Judah who would rule over all of the nation so even way back in, in the Torah right the first five books the first book of the Bible we see about this king that is to come and, and, and to rule over all the land and for me personally, when I read all these Old Testament passages that talk about this, I see the importance of, of, of understanding prophecy. And, and for me, there's no way I could ever deny the truth of Jesus and the truth of Scripture and the truth of God's plan of redemption, of redemption through salvation. Because I see all these Old Testament stories. I see, I see all these great men of God like Jacob and Isaiah and Zechariah talking about of this coming of a king who would come and rule the nations. And now I look at the Gospels. I look at Matthew and I see this man, Jesus, who had come and, and is fulfilling all these things. And like I said, this is personal. This becomes personal now because he was thinking about me. He was thinking about us as humanity. Uh, and he loved us enough to go through all that. He wasn't just a righteous man either. He was truly the king of kings who showed ultimate humility by not counting himself equality with God, even though he was in the very form God, just like that Philippians passage tells us. And another significant truth uh, that the triumphal entry teaches us about Jesus is that he is victorious. That word, Hosanna, is a strong and mighty word that translates to O oh, save in the Hebrew language, O oh, save. And the palm branches that they were waving at him, uh, th those were things that represented, that, that idea of the palm branch represented a great triumph. I think there's some power in knowing what he would do the following Sunday, right? By, by conquering sin and death, by, by rising, resurrection. That's what Easter is all about. Celebrating that resurrection and bringing us to life, bringing us to life from our sinful nature back to a, a righteous uh, restoration. Nature. So the palm branches, great triumph, victory, uh, Hosanna, oh save, those are victorious words, saving, uh, triumph. So those are what the palm branches represented, and those is what that word, Hosanna, the son of David, Hosanna in the highest, just as they were chanting, those, those exactly is what that, what, what that passage meant. So Christ is not only humble through the triumphal entry, but he is also victorious, as he becomes especially victorious through his resurrection. The resurrection is what made him victorious. And so many of the kings that we talked about over the past 11 weeks through our, our sermon series on Second Chronicles, they all had flaws. They were all flawed people. And, and they all had major flaws that negatively affected how they governed, as well as the legacy that they left behind for us historically as people that we weren't supposed to emulate, that we weren't supposed to pattern our life after, as it wasn't godly. We want to live godly lives. And these kings that we've talked about from the majority didn't live godly lives. So why would we want to live like them? We should, if anything, learn from example of how not to behave. But Jesus' life, that was something to emulate. His intentions were pure. His intentions were righteous. He even tells us, if we back things up in Matthew 6, that he says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He wasn't just telling us to seek first his kingdom,
But instead, Jesus himself sought first the kingdom. He wasn't just telling us to do it. He himself was living by example. And he was not only looking for the interests interest of himself, but he was instead looking at the interests of God and, and what he would have for us and what he would have for the world. So we as humans are definitely selfish at heart, or at least I am sometimes. And I, and I think it's important to know that a lot of times our, our selfishness, we want to do what's best for ourselves. And sometimes that might not be best for the others around us. But we know that when Jesus sought first the kingdom of God, he knew that what, what God had for us was ultimately what our hearts needed. So he counted others higher than himself. That, that's a great moral teacher. That's, that's a very mature leader to put him, the, the other people before himself. And, and I think that's an incredible thing to, to emulate, to understand as, as a leader, that other people are more significant than ourselves when we're, when we're in a leadership position, that we should look for and to take care of the flock that we're given. If that's in a work setting or a ministry setting, it's important to understand our calling and our nature. And Jesus lives that perfectly and in his nature. And I think that the last big, big attribute of God that, that we have to understand before we really understand what it, what it means uh, to, to celebrate this Palm Sunday it is to look at the attribute of God's grace. And, and again, I don't think we can truly understand the triumphal entry uh, unless we understand uh, this attribute of grace and, and the death of, of Christ or even, even his resurrection. They all point to this attribute of God's grace. And God's grace is what molds us. It's, it's, what, it's what shapes us into his image. And I think the beauty of, of a merciful king of kings, like, like we know who is Jesus, that he extends his grace to us in order that we might conform to him. That's a beautiful thing, is that God gives us this grace so that we can become closer to him, that we can conform to him. So again, I, I don't think we can understand this triumphal entry un, until we understand this attribute of grace that's laid out all throughout of the New Testament in Paul's writings, and, and, and even we see grace, grace in, in the Old Testament as well, but we especially see it on, in a new way on display in, in the New Testament. And eternal life is nothing more than an act of mercy, and it's a gift, it's a gift that is given freely and openly through our faith by God's grace. So I hope, we're, I hope we're seeing so far that this is more than just a man on a donkey. This, you know, this is the king of kings acting in perfect humility, uh, perfect victory, and grace. We, we see that this is a triumphal king entering. This is not just a man on a donkey. This is so much bigger. This is, he is entering into the land. He is coming into the world to save us from our sins, to give us a, a right reconciliation back to God. This is the true meaning uh, of Palm Sunday. And I think we need to see this. Uh, we need to see this because Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us in this room, every single one of us in this town, in this state, in this country, in this world have, has sinned and fall short of the glory, the expectation that God has demanded us to live by. And later he tells us that, uh, in, in Romans chapter 6, that the wages of sin is death. Death. But, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So grace is a gift, but also salvation is a gift. Because we know that on our own, death is the result. In uh, Romans uh, chapter 5, he even says, through Adam we all die but through Christ we all live. So without Christ, without this triumphal entry into the world, we're left with nothing but death. But with this triumphal entry, we're left with life, if we want to receive it, if we choose to receive it. And we only get one shot at this game called life. We only get one shot at it. And we know that our sin separates us from God. But this king, this king that we're reading about, this king of kings, who humbly rode into Jerusalem, who was prophesied to do so hundreds and hundreds of years ago, he came to be that atoning sacrifice for our sins. This king was 100% human, just like you and me, but 
this king was also 100% God. Just something that you and I can't relate to, but we need to understand that it was necessary, as this was the only way to be fully reconciled back to God. The Bible tells us that there is no mediator between God and man, but except through the person of Jesus Christ. So this triumphal entry points us to a king, but not just a king, the king of kings. And we can't understand the story unless we first understand who he is, fully God, fully man, and his purpose of coming. And that purpose of coming was ultimately to die. And if you've never put your faith in Christ this morning, I hope this sermon eats at you. I hope, it, I hope it's in the forefront of your mind. I hope, I hope you can see the power of this king who was not just a man, but he was fully God, who, who claimed to be God in the flesh. He didn't just, he didn't just, we don't just read about this, about this text about him being God. He claimed himself to be God. I hope that this sermon points you to this king. And I hope this becomes personal. It's not just history. This is a personal, who, personal person who wants to draw us into a relationship with him. And as we go throughout this Holy Week and eventually Good Friday and, of course, Easter, I hope we can understand the purpose of, of his coming, the purpose of who he is in all that, that he does. And when we, when, we, when we accept him, everything about our life transforms and, and it changes us. It changes how we view others. It changes the person we are, how we treat others. Everything about our life changes when we, when we humbly come and, and accept him for who he is in his nature. So I hope we can do that for the days and the weeks to come. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful for this king, this king of kings who came and obediently listened to, to you and your word and humbly came on a donkey and ultimately died on our behalf. But we know three days later he conquered sin and death uh, through the resurrection. And I hope that can be a reminder to us of your love being poured out on display, uh, but also your hatred toward, toward sin, Father. And, and, and we know that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, just like your word tells us. And I hope that we can grasp that this morning. I hope that we, our lives change because of this. This isn't just intellectual knowledge. This is a heart transformation to know who we are in the body of Christ, that we have different functions, that you give us different gifts. But none of this is possible if you had not come into the world. Father, I, pr I pray for each and every one of us here this morning. I pray for all of us who weren't able to make it this morning, that we just understand who you are in your nature. Again, we come to you this morning. Okay,